Good morning and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for January 27th, 2020. I'm your host, Jeanette Dopheide. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is the REN ISAC for research facilities projects with Kim Milford. Uh, the REN ISEC is the Research and Education Networks Information Sharing and Analysis Center, and Kim is the Executive Director of the REN ISEC. Before we begin, I have a few items to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions during the session using the chat box, and Kim uh, uh, would like to take your questions during the presentation, but we also are planning for time at the end as well. And with that, I will hand uh, the presentation over to Kim. Kim, welcome. Thanks. Hello, everyone. You sound great. Good. Let me um, get my slide deck here. I can death, by, death by PowerPoint, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thanks for, uh, for listening, for coming and listening in. Let's see if I can get these slides to advance. There we go. So we're going to talk about um, how the REN ISAC can help you at research facilities and research projects, um, some of the services we offer and things like that. Uh, so this is just a quick agenda. We you know, talk a little bit about the threat landscape and then um, how the REN ISAC can help uh, go through our services, talk about our information sharing, and um, a little bit about communities. Um, and feedback from you is, is very welcome, your questions, or uh, with communities, I'm gonna say, hey, what do you think about this? And hopefully uh, get some of your ideas on that. So uh, you can see, I don't have a lot. I don't have anything here on the history and mission of the REN ISAC. You'll be able to kind of discern the, the mission through the services. Um, and our history is, um, is long. We've been around since 2003, 2004. And, um, it covers research, networks, and education. So all three facets of our community are, are part of our mission um, intentionally. Uh, and the only other thing I'd say about history is that we are one of 28 of the, uh, of, of the ISACs. So the ISACs are essentially are every critical, every, every sector of the critical infrastructure with a few exceptions. And we're one of those few exceptions because we're actually a subsector of the public sector. Um, but they felt like we were, we were similar to uh, uh, like a municipality or something like that. So they felt it was important that we be represented at the National Council of ISACs. So in addition to the information sharing I'm gonna be talking about within our communities, we also, we also do that across the ISACs. And you know, there's one for there's a, there's 28, one for health, one for retail, one for defense. So you know what you can kind of imagine the large sectors of our of our um, of our uh, communities are uh, is is what those those represent. So the sharing happens at that level too. Although I'm not going to go into that too much. <clears throat> so the threat landscape. Uh, you know, this is where I get to scare you guys a little bit, right? Uh, we don't have dragons, don't worry. Um, but what what has replaced dragons? We uh, you know we see threats from malware, uh, from credentials, for uh, I'm sorry, theft of credentials, denial of service attacks, stolen laptops, and then the, the two biggie ones right now are ransomware and phishing. And what we find is a lot of times these are combined, except for uh, stolen laptops, which that's sort of a physical threat. Most of the other ones are over the internet and they're all related. And we find that phishing might be, phishing is almost always the, the way in for any other attack. That's how malware gets planted on computers. That's how ransomware attacks generally are spread. Not, not only, but generally are spread. Um, credentials are stolen through phishing attacks. And then denial of service, what we're seeing now, um, you know, ransomware has been around since the around 2010 and the first wave was just trying to get the ransom and you know freeze out one computer but now they're using it to deny service on a system and we saw that quite a bit at the beginning of the fall semester with um, universities that were uh, hit hit by a ransomware attack where it took out like their ad domain 
or a, you know, a, a critical business server. And then there was no way that school could, could open the doors and, and function. Um, we, we had it in higher ed. It's even more pervasive and threatening in um, K-12s right now that they're really getting bombarded with it. And we see that with, um, with uh, municipalities, county agencies, things like that. So um, the ransomware is, is definitely a, a fairly large deal right now. Um, I don't know if any of you guys were at uh, Internet 2's uh, technology exchange in New Orleans this fall, or I'm sorry, in December. The day we left, there was a ransomware attack that actually closed down some of the services of the city of New Orleans. So, uh, so several of my friends were like, did you cause that? I didn't, I, I don't know how, it wasn't me, <laughs> but it was sort of interesting timing. So fantasy references are over after that slide, don't worry. So I'm not gonna focus on the fear, uncertainty and doubt anymore. I'm just gonna give you some facts. And those facts are um, based on our CSERT activities. The Ren isac acts as a computer security incident response team for any EDU, um, any EDU organization. So we get feeds from many different places and we parse those feeds and find anything that looks like it's it started or came through a .edu. And then we analyze that and we send it on to the, the .edu, the university or the, the whoever's using it, the EDU approved address. And that's just US based, it's not for our foreign partners or foreign members. Um, but we'll send that on and we say, we think this looks like this sort of attack. And these are the, some of the, the common incidents that we see through our CSERT. This was for um, all of last year. Um, so compromised machines is uh, anything that has some malware or some virus. Uh, and I have some examples of that in a few slides. Compromised credential notifications. Now, these are just the notifications we send out. And one notification may have one compromised credential, or it may have all the way up to, you know, 20,000, 30,000. So it could be any number. Um, in the fourth quarter, we sent out 9,000 notifications, and that included 4,300,000 accounts that we notified about. Um, ooh, I can't remember which, uh, which, which uh, credential breach it was. I'll, I'll remember. Anyway, it was one of the large credential breaches that made all the headlines in the fall. And so um, the, of those 9,000 that we sent out, that covered 4,003 million credentials. So this, that's not really a good number as far as scale, but it's a good number as far as tracking how we manage it. Spam and phish is an area that we're trying to grow. We're trying to promote um, through our new, uh, our latest, the latest version of our security event system. Um, you can submit spam and phish, and then that allows us to share it with our, our spam warrior partners, like the anti-phishing malware group, uh, I'm sorry, the anti-phishing working group, and people like that, so we can all share and get smarter, analyze it, see what, you know, just figure out and define where it's coming from and what's happening there. So, um, so you can see that's growing from quarter one all the way through quarter four. Uh, vulnerable machines, we don't do a lot of notifications about vulnerabilities. Um, sometimes we'll see a specific uh, incident that we feel needs to be uh, mitigated quickly, so we'll notify about that. Um, sometimes we'll just see vulnerable machines in our feeds, and so we'll get that out if we have it. If we have the information, we're happy to pass it on, but we don't do any, we don't actively do vulnerability scanning as, as part of our standard services, at least not yet. Maybe that would be something you all would like to see. Open recursive DNS resolvers is kind of a steady ongoing problem and we get the, that word out uh, so that folks can close those down. The same with open mail relays. So those are our most common vectors of incidents that we see. Um, let me stop there and see if we have any questions. None so far. Okay, then I will proceed. So in looking at the, now I'm gonna go back again. I'm gonna get you guys dizzy with my going back. Uh, the first line here, the compromised machines. The next two slides are about that. So this is what we see. These are the exploits that we see on those compromised machines. 
um, in uh, this was third quarter. So it, I didn't get fourth quarter quite analyzed in time for this, but we find there's a lot of similarities between quarters. Um, Andromeda was the biggest. Uh, and then Conficker is is always, we always see Conficker. It's, uh, it's kind of funny. Um, and let me go ahead and go to, so this is my pretty color slide. Now the next one actually has more information, but isn't as pretty. Um, so these are the number of incidents that were reported during uh, the third quarter of 2019. So Conficker was you know, well below Andromeda, but look at the year discovered of Conficker, 2008. So you know, I'm really curious, is there something on those operating systems that make it hard to detect or is it, um, is it an operating system that can't be replaced or something like that? Because you know, by now we should have had these pretty much all cured and the fact that it's still hanging around for so long um, says something. And I don't see that. In a lot of times, what I see with higher ed is we're just a microcosm of all sectors. The things we're seeing, they're also seeing in the public sector and the health sector and the, banana, uh, the banking uh, sector. But, but Conficker does seem to be uniquely one of our problems. So is there something in our, in our environment that makes that true? Um, and, and, you know, so we need, we, we'd love to analyze that more and, and dig in a little more. Um, you can see that a few of these are ransomware, NIMAME and WannaCry. I WannaCry, I made a big, pretty big uh, comeback after its initial um, discovery in 2017. So uh, 400 uh, uh, incidents were reported on that last year. I'm sorry, in the third quarter of last year. Um, so we try to, we try to, you know, track where they're coming from, what they're doing, things like that. Um, so we, again, ransomware, a couple of the highest are ransomware related. And the rest of them are kind of spread out all over by type. Oh, let me stop there and see if there's any questions before I move into services. Yep, we got a question here. Do these incidents impact research infrastructure? For example, federated identity, research pro projects on campus, campus uh, compute clusters? Uh, yes, so what we, we mainly uh, analyze, I'm sorry, we, we get the information by IP address and then we have a, a fairly large contact uh, relational database that says, we believe this IP address belongs to this um, EDU again because we're just notifying edus so uh, so we would pass that through so we don't know what it is it is is it a server is it a desktop is it a uh, is it part of a cluster um we don't know what that that uh that end use is so absolutely it it impact impacts uh research clusters um and the credentials would be the same if it's a university credential again if it's related to a dot e, a us based dot edu we'll send those notifications to that EDU, but it could be used for a federated identity piece, um, which is one of the reasons why we've been working with our friends at InCommon um, on Certify, is how do we get the information about incidents on through to the information, um, the, I'm sorry, the identity users, the identity um, service, what's the word, I, not pri providers, um, but the, the ones downstream who use that identity that's been provided. So that is a concern. And then a, a quick follow-up. Uh, if my research project is a .org, not a .edu, can I still use RENISEC? Yes, absolutely you can. Um, you just won't get those notification services. Mm. Okay. I, I mean, sometimes if we know, an, uh, if, we would, if we'd know a, or, a .org is related, then we could, probably pass things along? That's a really good question. We just haven't, we haven't had that procedurally, but if we're seeing more and more people, more and more, especially research projects move to um, .org, then uh, we should talk about that and figure out a way to get you the information. Thank you. So I'm gonna uh, move into our, our services. We have a, a, a cadre of services. We have, um, some that are members only and some that are public offerings. And I'll walk through some of those in the upcoming slides. And then we do some analytical and some technical, um, where it's, you know, we're offering you the service and then you adopt it in your, um, in your environment and, and can make use of it, it, it 
as you need to for maybe for security event monitoring or in intrusion detection, things like that. And then we're, we're doing analytical too, where we'll write up and we'll say, this is how, th these are things you need to worry about about this. This, this is how you need to look at this. Um, some of it is community source. Some of it we create. Ren Isaac has a staff of 15 people. I think we're up to 16 now. Um, so we create some internally. Um, community sourced. We are very strong in our um, our, our mailing list uh, is is just massively busy. I know that there are several names I recognized on participants, so I'm sure you can attest to that. Um, and so we rely on the experts in our community, and that community source is one way that we're different from, from the other ISACs. Most of those, the other ones are all hub, where, where the hub sends out all the created content to the community. And we do that. We, we create and send it out, but we also rely on the experts in our community to, um, to provide that information to each other. And sometimes there's great stuff that they're providing. Um, sometimes we get early alerts from folks in other countries uh, you know, which isn't really the intention. They're just like, hey, we're seeing this, but it might be, um, it might be at, you know, two in the morning, uh, our time, you know, Eastern time. So it ends up being a nice early alert system for us that way. And we're doing more and more international sharing. We have, um, we have some international members um, and that's growing in the last couple of years. We've really seen that grow. And then the, the ISACs, the National Council of ISACs is trying to figure out how we can do more sharing across company, uh, country borders. Um, we, we scare, that really scares our friends at the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI. But if we can figure out the right way to share the right information, we can manage that, I think. And then sort of the last crossover is what we call blended threats. Our mission tends to be focused on cybersecurity and our depth of ex expertise does in the community and at the REN ISAC, and um, our, our mission talks about cybersecurity, but more and more we're seeing that you can't talk about cybersecurity without also talking about physical, and you can't talk about physical events without thinking about cybersecurity. So we've been paying more attention to blended threats and providing more analysis and warnings about them as well. So here's a, a, a list of, or these are the services that that you have to be a member to take advantage of. We, um, we have, so, and, and this isn't even, I, th I think this is fairly complete from a sort of a general roll up sense. We do, uh, we, we gather uh, logs, authentication logs, and we're tracking that and analyzing that. And we have, we moved this forward, but then we had to kind of wait until, uh, you'll see several, several down, there's a security event system. We had to wait until we did the upgrade on that. So we're, we kind of stopped our, 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 we didn't stop it. We we're just not doing as much analysis on the, the tracking of authentication logs right now. Um, so we'll jump back into that when, as we have time this year. Um, our daily watch report is always one of our top services. It's what I call our situational awareness report. We send it out every day around 5 p.m. It's, it's always based on public information. So news feeds, um, articles, things like that. But we, we just scour everything that's going on and try to group them and send them to folks so that you can make smart decisions about what's out there. We have a partnership with Farsight Security Incorporated for their, to use their passive DNS um, collection infrastructure. We have Ren ISAC members contribute and then Ren ISAC members can receive the, um, the access to um, Farsight's um, passive DNS collection information. And there's a lot of good helpful information about incidents that you can gather from passive DNS data. <clears throat> we have an annual member meeting and regional member meetings. Um, the annual member meeting is, it's, it's a conference style event. You know, a lot of people think of member meetings are more discussing the organization, um, but, but our, uh, our members have, have told us that they really want to use that time learning about security operations or security events and talking through things like that. Um, but it, there's also some nice informal networking and information sharing with, with folks. And then the regional member meetings, um, they can happen anywhere. You know, we work with the host and then they set it up, they, you know, they find the space, they set the agenda, they help get the word out, we help get the word out, things like that. So it just kind of builds that face-to-face -face trust piece. 
I mentioned the security event system. It's our threat intelligence system. It's built on um, the open source collective intelligence framework, which was sourced by NSF several years ago. And so we aggregate um, feeds on threats from many different sources. We do some analysis of it, and then we make it available to members so that you can take it and put it into your threat protection. Maybe you have uh, identity, uh, I'm sorry, incident um, uh, detection or prevention services. Maybe you have a SIM, maybe you have firewall rules. So you can take the IP addresses, the URLs, the domains, even email addresses, and plug that into your setup, your appliances, your protections to stop that act, those, those known bad um, external sources from coming in. And we just upgraded this recently. It's faster. It's, um, there's, uh, there's more ways to interact with it. As I mentioned before, um, you can now send uh, spam or phishing reports that go into SAS right away. So uh, it's, it's uh, a more, I think it's more user friendly. Um, and then the speed of, of how we make that available is, is much faster. So that's great. We offer um, webinars, essentially monthly, not necessarily. Um, actually, I think we have more, uh, we're going more often than monthly these days, um, just because we have uh, some great submissions to include there. Um, and if, we, if the, uh, the speaker allows us to, we'll make those offered publicly too. But some of them will always be just members because maybe it's an incident, um, review and the uh, the university or the organization that suffered that incident doesn't want to share it publicly. So we'll always respect and acknowledge that as well. <clears throat> In addition to the member services, we have public services. Um, there's that word again, blended threat, um, blended threat workshops. These are one day events. Um, they're not they're, they, they have an exercise component to them, like a, you know, a emergency exercise component, but it's not just exercise. It also is a lot of, you know, planning and stimulating thinking on how to manage an incident. Um, so again, this combination of physical and cyber, the ones we did in the over the last couple of years, we did a pandemic that impacted the IT staff. The IT staff got uh, was all sick in our exercise, so they couldn't do their work. Um, I'm trying to. Oh, the year before that, we did a contentious speaker on campus, and so there was a whole social media campaign against the speaker. And then there were, you know, there were physical threats and a denial of service attack. So again, it impacts both the physical and the cyber. And then the one we're planning for um, 2020 is ransomware, because again, we're seeing that where. Uh, as some of the universities that were impacted in the fall, it did impact their physical systems. There, there were lock, building lockouts. There was access to certain um, uh, resource, you know, physical resources that folks couldn't get into. So uh, it truly is blended threat. Um, I've talked a lot about our CSERT activity. So that's just something we do for everyone. Um, we participate with Educause and Internet2 on HECVAT, Higher Education um, cloud Vendor Assessment Toolkit, and I feel like they renamed it, but it's still the same initials, HECVAT, so, um, so just uh, keep that in mind if I don't have the name right, quite right on that. Um, but it's a, a, a list of questionnaires about security and privacy that, that, that you can send to vendors and then have them complete it, and it's, it's very comprehensive, but there's also a light version. So there's, I think the full version has 250 questions. The light version has 125. And so that can be sent to vendors and we can ask them to fill it out. And um, the questionnaire allows things to be ranked. So maybe you'll say, well, their physical security is really good, but you know, we weren't too sure about uh, um, their identity management, their identity protection. So maybe, uh, so you'd get these rankings after they, they fill out the questionnaire. And then we have what we call the Cloud Broker Index, where that once a vendor fills it out, we, we, we try to encourage them to provide it to everyone. And some of them just provide the, the flat out um, completed assessment questionnaire. Other ones make you go through their, their paywall, which is fine, right? That they, they have the right to control that. So it's sort of interesting, um, but it's, it's just another tool that you can use. It's, it's fairly substantial and it, once they complete the questionnaire, 
you have to have good analysts on hand who can tell you what the what that means and what they would do about it right so um, maybe you'd say well you can use it but you can't use it for our most critical information you can only use it for for a lower level of information we do a lot of operational best practices looking at techniques and tactics and practices for common operations um, we recently did one for international travelers and the folks who support the international travelers, like what to do, what to think about when you travel uh, overseas with your computer, you know, always use a VPN. <clears throat> we try to talk most um, organizations into having a, a, some, some lo loaner PCs versus taking your own PC with you and things like that. We started a, a, a script scripting share um, where members who use Office 365 logs, they can you can build your own logs. And so they shared their scripts for doing that. And anyone can grab that and use it and share their theirs. If, if you have a good one that's working well and you use that for your analysis, then you can share that log as well. And then we do peer assessments where we um, go out and uh, look at the cybersecurity posture of an organization to figure out how we can help, how they can mitigate risks. Um, and we really focus on actionable recommendations. It's not, it's not ISO. It is, um, it is NIST cybersecurity framework based. Um, so we we try to keep it, you know, keep it at our standards. Um, but it's not an audit. It's more, it's much more user friendly and uh, and informal than that. All right. Any questions? No questions. I think we have a clarification, though, regarding the vendor assessment tool. It was recently renamed Higher Education Community Vendor Assessment Tool, the HECVAT. Thank you. Yes. So they changed cloud to community. I knew there was a, diff a change in the name. <laughs> That's very helpful. So we, uh, we're doing our membership survey currently, and uh, this is hot off the press, uh, it, which is funny because I didn't even mention alerts and advisories in the services. Um, because there, it's not, the alerts and advisories we send out, we do them, um, but sometimes we can go a whole year without sending one because nothing rises to the level of urgency that requires an alert or an advisory. And we have, our, our philosophy is very different from, um, the multi-state ISAC is sort of the public sector ISAC, where it's municipalities and counties and um, school districts and things like that. They, they'll send out an alert or an advisory whenever they get one. So, um, you know, Microsoft does their, their monthly updates and they send out alerts or advisories based on that. Um, we don't send things that we think most people already have access to, like the Microsoft ones. Um, we do keep, we do put those in our daily watch report, the daily situational report I talked about. So they are available, but we don't send them out as a separate alert or advisory. Um, our alerts or advisory, so our alerts or advisories tend to be really high level. Um, I'm sorry, really urgent, um, high need. And, um, and we take a little bit of time to write them, to frame them and write them um, in a way that makes sense to uh, to our to research education and networks, um, so it's it's more relevant. And I think that that's why that oh, that satisfaction rating is so high is because we we take the time to do that. Whereas a lot of other um, folks might might get an alert out quick more quickly. It might take us a few days, but then we tell you what to do with it. So we're, we're very we provide more information to help folks. Um, the Daily Watch also has a very high satisfaction overall, 86%. Um, and then our notifications that we talked about, uh, very high uh, overall satisfaction on that. So, um, so we're able to get the information to the, um, the, the incident response team to make decisions and take action right away. And that's really what we focus on. We focus on operational and action, you know, so uh, we don't say, we think you've been compromised. We're like, we're pretty sure you're compromised. This is how it looks. This is what you need to do about it. So we try to try to provide as much information on those, those compromised system notifications as we can as well. Uh, looks any... like we got a question here. Yep. Um, would a research project becoming a member give them access to the same community as educational institutions or is it separate? Also, is there a minimum requirement for the maturity of the project in order to become a member? 
such as a require such as requiring a CISO role to be present. Uh, really good question. Thank you. And um, I'll, I, I have that on a later slide, but I'll go ahead and jump in now. So we have our, 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 our bread and butter and our traditional community has been the security operations community. And so that tends to be like a centralized CISO office at a university or at a research network or a large research project um, or, or facility. Um, but two years ago, we, we moved to a, a standard and a, a imp, a implementation for the communities for what we're calling enterprise participation. So, so now members don't have to be part of that central security team. The central security team will still be there and they're still gonna be helpful and the experts in a lot of things, but, um, but they're not the only community. So we, you know, we, we created the infrastructure to be able to support this. And so we're, 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 we're forming these separate communities. Right now, we only have a few. Right now we have the SecOps and we have a general community that anyone can access. And so that'd be accessing the same things to a large degree as what the security folks do. Although they'll have some operational things that won't be on the general community. And then the third community we have currently is officers. And so that's like the CIOs and CISOs and folks like that. Um, but we are, we, this year we're, we're back to our infrastructure building on the system, our registry, which allows us to frame those communities and roll them out. So we're um, going to be rolling out more communities this year. And I see, um, I see research being a community. I see healthcare being a community. I have some other ideas, and I, I really welcome your ideas and your thinking on this. So um, with that, I'm going to stop, and then we'll get to that slide in a few minutes and can talk about it more. Anything else? You're good. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to talk a little bit about information sharing. <clears throat> we use uh, we use our own information sharing. Uh, guidelines, it's loosely based on, this is um, Department of Homeland Security, CESA's, and it's called TLP, Traffic Light Protocol. Um, and, and I like it because it's nice and clear. And it's easy to say, um, you know, TLP Amber. A lot of what we share is TLP Amber. That's our default when something is shared on one of our mailing lists, it's TLP Amber. And the nice thing about all these is you can add and, and sort of put additional disclaimers or additional limits on them. Um, and we always try to put it at the top, we, we, we encourage people to put it at the top of their document so that people can see exactly what that is. Um, but here's a really nice um, uh, um, DHS provided chart that shows the different, the different sharing. Um, ours are a little bit different right now. We have restricted, privileged, limited, and public, I think, are Ren Isaacs. Um, and they, they essentially, they, they, they're about the same. They're very parallel to these. Um, and we're, we're going to be moving what we call, we could call it Ren Isaac TLP. So it's not exactly the same as CISA, but it's very similar so that people will be able to know and recognize and apply it more quickly. And the information about, or the, one of the important things about this, uh, actually, I think this is on the next slide. Yeah. Um, so we have this trusted community, the sharing expertise that we know we, you know, we all understand the information sharing guidelines, which are published publicly on our, our public website and, um, and discussed frequently on our mailing lists and on our, our member wiki. So we make those available. And so we know that everyone in our community understands that. Um, so that allows us to have sort of subgroups and breakout groups and communities because you're always protected by that. Um, for instance, uh, the OmniSOC, which is the, the SOC operated out of IU, um, they all have to be Ren ISAC members. And the reason that they set it up that way is because that way the members of OmniSoc are, are held to the same sharing standards as our members are. So they don't have to worry that, they don't have to create their own. They just say, you're part of Ren ISAC, you gotta follow Ren ISAC's information sharing guidelines. So, um, so you get that trusted community sharing. There's also some vetting that goes on in the community sharing, um, especially at the security operational level. Now that we've gotten into the enterprise participation model, um, the vetting is a little different, right? Because we, you know, we don't, we don't need to worry so much about, maybe we're gonna have a communicators, a security communicators community. 
um, where they share um, alerts and advisories that they send, you know, internally to their universities or their organizations. Um, and for that, you wouldn't need as high of a vetting service as you would for security, an operational security one. And then the, um, the picture, we're trying to do some more um, fun examples of why information sharing is important. So this is just an example of that. So getting into the communities a little bit. As I said, uh, SecOps, that's our oldest community that's been around since we, we started. Um, and then Officers is, is a new one. Uh, um, and so we have a group uh, developed. It's not a very noisy group. It's not very chatty. Obviously, officers don't want to be, uh, be bothered by, by the details. So um, some of them do. And if so, they can join. It, they can either, if they have the... Um, the credentials, they can join SecOps or they can be on the, the open discussion list, the general discussion list, so they can see it that way. Um, so we, we see us expanding to a research um, community, healthcare, international networks, as I mentioned before, maybe a communicators community. Um, and, you know, we're open to other communities. And so what we want to do is, is give the communities the, the tools and services to allow them to um, to have a, a place where they can talk and share, but then also talk and share with the greater RENISAC community. Um, so some of the services that go along with that would be, uh, you know, encouraging intermember uh, communications. That right now is predominantly through our mailing lists, um, which are, as I mentioned before, very active. I'm not sure how much longer we're gonna have active mailing lists. I know a lot more people do significant filtering of their mailing these days. And so maybe we don't have as much activity as we used to. Um, people are looking for chat, instant message sort of things. And so we're, uh, we've got a project to work on that this coming year. Um, so that's why I called it intermember communications because I didn't wanna say emailing lists and limit us to that. Um, situational awareness, training and education, analysis. And I think the analysis is gonna be a, a very big difference maker. But the analysis we do for those involved in healthcare is probably going to look different from the analysis we do for the officers or for the networks. So that's going to be sort of uh, our, 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 our point where things look different. Assessments too. We offer this general assessment um, right now, but will we cater those so that, uh, the, that the network's assessment looks very different than the research assessment? And that's not developed out yet. Um, so again, as with the, the communities themselves, I look forward to hearing from you and from our members about what other services you'd like to see for the communities. I think that that's it. Great, thank you. Um, well, why don't we get, let people type questions? And so I'll grab the screen back and just go over a few um, a few things happening uh, with Trusted CI. Great, thank you. So thank you everyone for coming to our presentation and we'd like you to take a survey. Uh, the survey is to give us some feedback on your experience but also to, uh, we have a comment section to, for you to request topics or other presentations that you'd like to see. So go ahead, uh, I just put it in the chat there uh, so that you can click on it. Uh, go, uh, please let us know how you, how, um, let us know what you think. And other stuff going on, let's see. So we've got some save the dates that we'd like to make the community aware of. For, uh, first, we've got EDUCAUSE Security Professionals Conference. That's April 21st through 23rd in Bellevue, Washington. I don't know if you guys have ever been to Bellevue. It's beautiful. So I, I, if that's uh, all you needed to register to attend, I would, I, re I would recommend that you go. And registration is open. And then PERC 20 is coming up in July on the 26th through the 30th in Portland, Oregon. Their CFP is open. Registration's not open yet. So keep an eye out for the topics that they're looking for. And then our trusted CI NSF Summit, uh, the 2020 summit will be held September 22nd through 24th in Bloomington, Indiana. And uh, to get updates about the Trusted uh, CI NSF Summit, uh, you can 
find them on our website or, or join our mailing list. Um, I think we got a question here. Um, research project members with an interest in security can join the research community and research project members with operational security responsibilities join the SecOps? Yes. And you can join multiple communities. If uh, the SecOps one is, is vetted again, so you have to kind of prove your expertise in your job title and things like that. And we might find that other ones need that sort of vetting. Um, I, 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 you know, we're, we're gonna push for openness as much as we can to allow more people in because I'm not hearing the security problems going away that we need more people involved. Right. Um, so, you know, we're gonna try to leave them as open as possible, but maybe there's gonna be like one finite group um, maybe it's going to be incident responders who use MISP or who use the Hive or use IRT tracking. And so that might be closed because we want to prove that the, the people who really use that are in it. Um, looks like we have someone who raised their hand, but I can't enable your microphone. So if you could just type the question in the chat, please. Um, and you can find the chat by, uh, there should be a chat icon in your application view. Um, sometimes it disappears depending on what pops up. So if you click on the more button, you might see chat at the top there. Um, other, other events coming up for Trusted CI. Um, our next webinar is going to be February 24th at 11 Eastern. And the topic is FABRIC. Uh, it's a new project. It's, it's the, the acronym stands for Adaptive Programmable Networked Research Infrastructure for Computer Science. And the presenter will be Anita Nikolic. And I don't know if any of you know who she is. She served as an NSF program officer. So you, may, you might be uh, familiar with her. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Do one last call. I see oh, people are saying thank you. So uh, I just wanna say thank you all for coming and thank you very much, Kim, for attending. I'm sure that you are available to answer questions offline if people want to contact you. Yeah, I am and thank you so much for inviting me. Great, um, with that, I will stop the recording and when I end the meeting, you will all be kicked out, but uh, thank you very much for attending and I hope to see you in February. Thank you everyone.